68K CPU in 1979 and the processor changed the world of home computing. Not only home computing, less, actually the entire computing industry and not only computing industry. Uh, but here I'm focusing on home computing. So if you look at the three computers which are standing next to me, the Apple Lisa here, uh, the Amiga 500 and um, the Apple Macintosh, they all are based on the 68K um, CPU, the first, uh, the first iteration of those processors. Why first iteration? Because Motorola 68K was not only a revolutionary processor for its time. Remember, it uh, was introduced in the world of dominated by 8-bit uh, uh, processors. So it was a 16 or 32-bit processor, depending on how you look at it. And uh, the programmers and hardware developers were really looking forward to using this processor. It was easy to program. It was uh, very capable for its time. And there was like, it seems that its capabilities are almost endless. But it wasn't only that. The processor has also started the entire line of processors. So 68000 was just the first one. There were 010 later. It was followed by 020 uh, used in some of the Amigas. 030, 040 also in Amigas in the desktop versions. 030 was also used in this Apple, uh, in a later version of this Apple. Uh, Macintosh, all the way to 060, which was used, uh, for example, in those very capable expansion cards for the Amiga. Uh, this is an 030, by the way. That card is manufactured already in modern times, modern meaning post-2010. But this one was uh, contemporary to the Amiga and it was it contained a very capable 060 processor. These processors are cu currently highly sought for uh, because they there weren't that many introduced and they are still used by many many enthusiasts especially of the Amiga. But even though Motorola ended the line of 68k processors there with 060 some enthusiasts continued the uh, development and for example here uh, we see a vampire card manufactured just a couple of years ago which contains a completely new um, iteration of 68k architecture called 68080 uh, contained within an fpga chip so uh, the dream uh, uh, lives and continues, uh, we may say. And today I wanted to, to say a few words about an educational board introduced by Motorola in 1981, which was used specifically to educate people and to train developers on the capabilities of this processor. So this board not only contains the processor itself, the 68K processor itself, but it's actually, it actually contains all the parts needed to run software. It's basically a complete computer on one board. The board was um, sold for $495, which seemed a lot, but it was actually relatively cheap for uh, a processor of that, or for, a, for a computer, actually a complete computer of uh, these capabilities. Um, my speculation is that Motorola may not have had huge margin on that uh, board. They, their purpose was to popularize the, uh, the processor, to introduce it to college environments and to industrial uh, training environments in order to make that uh, processor more uh, popular. Um, this board is uh, a one that I bought a few years ago and um, we can we can say a few words about it but in short uh, it's a, as I said a complete computer on a board it has the processor it has memory here 30, 30 uh, uh, two, uh, kilobytes of memory it has expansion slots for serial connections uh, it has uh, ROM with very interesting tutor software it's called tutor 
uh, and has all um, the parts needed to interact with the external world, including a parallel interface, uh, even a tape um, uh, uh, interface for recording and loading programs. Um, what I'm going to do is try and um, connect this uh, ECB board, Motorola 68K educational computer board, to uh, a modern Raspberry Pi uh, board. Uh, and I want to uh, try and do two things. First, use the Raspberry as, the, as a dumb terminal in order to operate the, the built-in tutor software on, uh, loaded on this ROM. And second, uh, Raspberry Pi would also be acting as the host computer for this board. Let's see if I succeed in that. Um, but first, uh, before we do that, let's quickly uh, introduce the hardware capabilities of uh, this board. The 68K educational computer board, which is 40 years old at the time when I'm recording this video, was quite capable hardware-wise. Except for a keyboard, display and the power supply, it is a complete computer on a single PCB. The 68000 CPU is clocked at 4 MHz by an 8 MHz crystal oscillator, whose clock rate is divided by 2 using a counter chip. 32K of RAM is an amount comparable to home computers of that era and enough for serious experimentation. Memory is controlled by separate memory control logic and address multiplexer chips, because Motorola would introduce memory management logic within the CPU only starting from 68000 generation of the processor. There are two RS-232 ports, one for connecting a dumb terminal, another for data exchange with a host computer. There are also a parallel interface for a printer, for example, and an audio interface for tape data storage. Users can also take advantage of the built-in 24-bit programmable timer and the wire wrap area where input-output connections are exposed for experimentation with additional circuitry. Okay, so these were the hardware capabilities or hardware features of uh, uh, the Motorola 68K uh, educational computer board. Um, as a sort of uh, digression here, uh, 68K uh, ECB was not the only uh, educational or training uh, board uh, made, by, uh, made for a specific um, CPU. Uh, here we see uh, one that was made, by, made for, um, for the MOS or MOS 6502 8-bit processor, an older uh, an older uh, board. Uh, this is made by Synertec. It's called Sim Model 1 and I'm definitely gonna uh, uh, create a short video about it uh, in some future time. But today let's continue focusing on our um, uh, Motorola 68K uh, ECB board uh, and um, let's, uh, let's see what we can do with it. And before I talk about this project, Motorola ECB, uh, one more note about uh, how versatile uh, the uh, Motorola 68K processor was. So I have with me here a calculator made by Texas Instrument TY92. This uses Motorola 68K CPU. Um, and. Uh, just behind me sitting here, not sure if it can be seen correctly here, but this enormous and heavy laser printer by Apple, one of the first laser printers made by Apple, also uses the uh, 68K uh, CPU. So uh, the processor was and still is um, an extremely um, uh, popular and versatile uh, chip used in all kinds of um, home and industrial uh, systems and that's why maybe also this uh, uh, board is so interesting to look at if someone wants to explore 
um, the internal workings of that, uh, that CPU. Um, so let's talk about the uh, little project uh, here itself. Um, as I mentioned, uh, I wanted to make the uh, Motorola um, educational computer board work with uh, Raspberry Pi somehow. So I figured out the the board has two ways of communicating with um, uh, with uh, external systems to serial serial interfaces for that communication. Uh, so I thought, why not Raspberry Pi? Um, why not make Raspberry Pi uh, use both serial um, channels of communication? One for uh, the, ver the the dumb uh, terminal, just a console, basically output and input, and second one uh, for uh, what the uh, designers of this board call call host communication, meaning exchanging of data with uh, host computers. So. The Raspberry Pi here will uh, act as both the dumb terminal and uh, host computer for this ECB board. And I'm going to go backwards a little bit because this project is already assembled. You see, it's uh, uh, it's complete, uh, it's finished. Uh, it uh, even has the uh, acrylic boards on top of and bottom of it. Uh, the Raspberry Pi is attached here. It's powered uh, from that external. Um, ATX uh, power supply and it's displaying things on that monitor um, so I'm gonna go backwards and uh, say a few words about the challenges that I had when building this project but first um, because it's already complete let's have a look uh, very briefly how it works we'll go into that into the detail of that um, uh, later in the in the video uh, but just to show what I wanted to accomplish and what I uh, managed to do, uh, uh, have a look at the uh, monitor behind me. It's displaying an uh, image from this uh, Raspberry Pi here. Um, and on the left hand side, in the left terminal window here, I'm going to zoom in later. Uh, so on the in the left terminal window, it's actually displaying the output of the ECB board. So this is our dumb terminal here, just displaying whatever this board is um, is displaying. And the prompt here reads Tutor 1.3, which is the version of the uh, built-in uh, ROM um, um, uh, software here. Uh, whereas on the right-hand side, uh, we just see the regular Raspberry Pi output. And what we're gonna do is uh, we're gonna cut the uh, say cut dev tty sc1 which is the second serial port uh, of uh, our ecb board we're just gonna try and preview the content of that file nothing is happening now but if i switch back to the tutor software and type du to say 1000 1200 I'm going to explain later what it all means, uh, but basically what I'm going to do is now dump the content of the memory from the ECB board onto the second serial port, so it should display display in that second window. Did we manage to do that? Yes, we are. The content of uh, memory there is being displayed on the second terminal window in what is called uh, an S format. Um, made by Motorola, uh, in invented by Motorola, and again, I'm going to talk about it later. But first, uh, you see, like it's all working now nicely, but it wasn't uh, that easy to achieve. So let me go backwards and uh, talk about some of the challenges that I had with this uh, this uh, project. Before embarking on building this project, which I vaguely defined in my head as somehow connect Motorola ECB to Raspberry Pi, I wanted to check if the board is actually operational. The manual goes to great lengths to warn against incorrect voltage application, so I was extra careful in how I connected a modern ATX power supply. Apparently applying 5 volts before 12 volts could cause damage to memory chips. A correct ATX power supply should be able to supply both voltages at the same time, or even 5 volts with a slight delay, which was what we wanted. 
I measured the levels in the power supply, which I've taken out of an old PC, and carefully connected the live and ground wires. The ECB board I used had some kind of power socket attached for convenience, which lo looked like a smaller Molex connector. I wanted to buy a matching plug, but I realized I have no idea what type of Molex that was, or even if it was a Molex in the first place. If anyone knows, uh, let me know. I ended up connecting the wires one by one, with the plan to remove the old plug altogether when I get to assembling the final build. Next, I had to connect a terminal via the serial interface on port 1. I really wanted to try the board out still before I bought the proper edge connectors, so I soldered the wires to the pins, connected them to a DB9 plug, connected the plug to an old MS-DOS machine, loaded Kermit terminal software on that machine and hoped for the best. And it didn't work. The ECB seemed to power on, but Kermit didn't seem to receive any signal from the board. I spent hours checking the serial connection pinouts and transmission parameters, to no avail. And finally it dawned on me that the serial port on my PC may not be enabled at all in BIOS, which turned out to be the case. Having rectified that, the rest was smooth sailing. Kermit displayed Tutor 1.3 prompt, probably for the first time in decades of this board's life. Now that I had confirmed that the board was working, it was time to get more serious. To ensure reliable power transfer from the ATX power supply to both the Motorola ECB and Raspberry Pi, I bought and installed an ATX power transfer board, which has an ATX socket on one side and convenient cable connectors for each voltage line and ground on the other. It is also equipped with a switch which eliminates the need to shorten power on pins on the ATX power supply plug. In addition to connecting the ECB itself, in parallel I connected my Raspberry Pi to power lines. It is good to make sure the power connection on Raspberry is reliable, especially if one doesn't use the USB power supply but provides own power source via 5V and ground pins of the GPIO header as I did here. Even though the power requirements of both Raspberry Pi and the ECB, totaling at around 3000 mA at 5V and 50 mA at 12V were well within the limits of the ATX power supply, when I used thinner cables with inserted plugs, I got low voltage warnings on the Pi. The problem was solved when I replaced them with thicker 20 AWG cables and, instead of plugging, soldered them onto the GPIO pins. After I had seen the board display its prompt in MS-DOS Kermit, I thought achieving the same on the Raspberry Pi would have been trivial. In the end, a serial connection is just a serial connection, and a terminal emulator is just a terminal emulator. They should all work the same everywhere. I couldn't have been more wrong. First, Raspberry Pi comes without RS-232 compatible serial port. Its UART serial communication device operates at lower voltage, 3.3 volts, than RS-232. So connecting receive transmit lines from the ECB to the Pi could result in damaging the Pi. An RS-232 compatible serial port had to be added to the Raspberry. I purchased a UART RS-232 conversion hut with two DB9 ports, which not only did allow me to use the Raspberry Pi for two purposes, as dumb terminal and as a host, but also was equipped with LEDs to display the status of each of the serial ports transmit and receive lines. Those LEDs turned out to be extremely helpful in troubleshooting the serial connections between the ECB and Pi. In addition, I purchased 20-pin edge connectors for each serial port, and a matching rainbow-colored ribbon cable with, with 2.54 mm pitch. <laughs> 
that is the distance between wires. The biggest challenge was to figure out which pin of the Motorola ECB was supposed to be connected to which pin of the RS232 port. That was the most time-consuming part of the entire project. The ECB manual provides instructions for how to connect individual ECB pins to specific RS232 pins, but the pinout is provided for the older type DB25, so the first obstacle was to translate that to DB9 pinout. Moreover, each of the board's serial connectors behaves in a different way, with port 1 acting as so-called DCE equipment, while port 2 as a DTE. But even though I got the connections right as per DCE, DTE pinouts, I still wasn't able to get any signal from the ECB to the Raspberry Pi. According to the flashing LEDs on my RS232 hat, transmission was happening from the Pi to the ECB when I pressed keys on the keyboard, but nothing was being sent back. The exact same connection to an old PC with Kermit installed worked perfectly with bi-directional communication. I was stuck. My table was a cobweb of wires and ultimately I decided to get my oscilloscope and investigate deeper. It is quite amazing how much one can learn about serial communication by looking at oscope screen. After connecting one probe to TX line and ground and the other one to RX line and ground and setting the trigger I was able to observe the full exchange caused by pressing one key on the keyboard. But all that watching of the communication between the ECB and PC still didn't help me solve the problem. Finally, it occurred to me that the issue might not be in transmit-receive lines at all, but on some other supporting serial lines, and I went back to rereading the manual. And there it was. In the appendix, there was a more detailed note about how this specific implementation of RS-232 works. In particular, how switching the RTS line to low is required to start communication, and how putting it to high instead ena enables a special transparent mode in the ECB, which causes the board to just pass through anything it receives from one port to another, effectively preventing me to see anything on one single port. This was definitely a eureka and a cry of relief after hours of desperate try and error. I could only blame myself for not reading the manual end to end. Having resolved the issue, I was now able to document the working connections for posteriority. As for the aesthetic aspect of the build, I didn't like how the Motorola ECB was resting directly on the table so I ordered acrylic sheets laser cut to the same dimensions as the board. For assembly I used metal spacers, screws and nuts. I used the same M3 screws for attaching the Raspberry Pi to the top sheet and then the RS232 hat to the top of the Raspberry Pi and that required drilling through Raspberry's mounting holes which are slightly narrower. Since most of my troubleshooting revolved around the RS232 hat, the design keeps the power attachment and Raspberry Pi on the top. When I'm ready to start fiddling with custom circuitry on the ECB board itself, I may want to swap them, moving the Pi and the power section to the lower floor while putting the ECB on the top. Despite my earlier promise, I decided not to go into detail about the Tutor software itself in this video. The reason is that it is interesting enough to deserve its own video which I'm planning to make later, and is also very well documented in the ECB's manual if anyone is interested now. Let me just say that it supports reading from and writing to arbitrary memory locations, assembling and disassembling programs, stepping through the execution of a pro program, 
previewing all CPU registers at any time, setting breakpoints, converting between digital and hexadecimal, and much more. For those who want to start right away and are intimidated by the necessity to read from or write to a serial device on the Raspberry Pi to exchange programs with the ECB, in the description and my article below I have provided two Python scripts which automate saving files from and writing files to the board. And that is it. Uh, that's the whole thing. Uh, Raspberry Pi is now communicating uh, seamlessly with the 40-year-old um, Motorola educational computer board. Um, and uh, I'm very happy I was able to achieve that. Um, and uh, I think it gives us now a very nice vintage development development platform um, my next steps uh, what i'm planning to do um, is to uh, install uh, a cross assembler on this uh, raspberry pi i'm thinking about um, vasm vasm um, a very uh, a very interesting uh, project uh, for cross compiling and build myself a development environment on the Raspberry Pi so that I can seamlessly upload uh, the assembled programs onto the board and run them, debug them then, correct them again on Raspberry Pi, again run and uh, uh, basically build uh, something interesting and uh, on the way also learn uh, about building for uh, Motorola 68K. Um, why uh, don't I use uh, emulators for that? Of course I could, but uh, where is the challenge and fun in that? So that was that, and uh, if I am able to uh, uh, build or uh, learn something interesting, I'll definitely share uh, in my uh, future videos. Uh, so that was that. Uh, thanks, and uh, thanks for watching. Th thank you for uh, uh, giving thumbs up, thumbs up for uh, this video. And uh, till next time.